the program for evaluation. Uh, you can use this link or the QR code displayed in the opening slideshow to get your to get your credit. Um, Updates in Pediatrics is a monthly live stream program given on the third Wednesday of the month at noon. Programs will also be available online following this program at NortonCME.com. During the presentation, you can type questions into the chat portion of the screen, and I will address those questions at the end of the presentation. So today I would like to introduce our speaker, Victoria Statler. Dr. Statler is one of our pediatric infectious disease physicians at Norton Children's Hospital. She is also a, an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Disease in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Louisville. Dr. Statler is the program director for the Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellowship Program, and she is the director of pediatric transplant infectious diseases at Norton Children's Hospital. She is also a uh, principal investigator for industry-sponsored clinical trials of new antimicrobial agents in immunocompromised children, and as well as a phase three vaccine trials in healthy children. So we'd like to welcome Dr. Statler. And before she starts, we just want to do one polling question uh, so she knows her audience. So if you guys could put up the polling question. Okay, so what best describes you or your practice? Pediatrics, family practice, emergency medicine, pediatric subspecialist, or a hospitalist or other? Give everyone a second to enter that. And we can display the results. All right, about half pediatrics. All right, so welcome Dr. Statler. Great, thank you Dr. McDonald. Um, and thank you uh, Norton for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, this is really gonna be a talk about um, some of the tick-borne diseases we see here in the state of Kentucky. Um, and uh, it kind of has two parts. The first part, we're gonna talk about tick-borne rickettsial diseases, which are the ones that we tend to see um, most of here in Kentucky. And then I am also gonna spend a few minutes at, towards the end of the talk um, to discuss Lyme disease, which we don't see very frequently, but we have had a few cases um, recently. So uh, thank you. I don't have any disclosures, um, but like Dr. McDonald said, I am a local site principal investigator for some vaccine trials of which we will not be talking about today. These are the objectives. Um, we will talk about the most common tick-borne diseases in Kentucky children. Um, we'll discuss how to differentiate between those diseases and other illnesses that we may see in children, and then talk about the screening and diagnostic tests and then treatment regimens as well. So I do have two other quick audience response questions. Um, if we can go ahead and put the first one up. And this is just, um, well, there we go. So this is just to kind of get a feel for, um, again, kind of my audience and sort of things that um, we know here at the beginning of the talk. And then I will go through the answers to these um, as we, as I go through the talk, as I go through the presentation. Okay, give everybody a second. Okay. So, um, yes, so which tick-borne or Ketzeal diseases are seen in Kentucky children? Um, the answer is B and C. We do see ehrlichiosis and Rocky Mountain spotted fever here in Kentucky. Very rarely see anaplasmosis um, unless patients have a history of travel. And we'll talk a little bit about that here shortly. And then the second question is, what would you use to treat a tick-borne rickettsial disease such as ehrlichiosis? Um, and so we have a few options here, amoxicillin, azithromycin, Bactrim, chloramphenicol, doxycycline, um, or none of the above. Okay, and 
Um, yes, so the correct answer is dot C cycling. Chloramphenicol actually can be used um, to treat Rocky Mountain spotted fever and ehrlichiosis. It, it used to be used a lot. Um, we don't use it anymore just because of its side effects. Um, it's also, I think, I don't think we can get it anymore here in the United States, um, but it has been used in the past, definitely. So, all right. So kind of launching into um, our talk today, um, I wanted to start with a case, actually. And this case is near and dear to me. This is actually the case that um, uh, is, it's actually the reason why I went into infectious diseases. Um, I saw this patient when I was a first year medical student, and it was the first patient I'd ever actually seen in the ICU here at Norton Children's Hospital. Um, and so I wanna walk through this case just to give you an idea of how these patients present and how um, confusing um, it can be from the beginning because their illnesses do look um, very similar to other more common viral illnesses that you may see in childhood. So I'm gonna introduce you to Maddie. Um, Maddie developed symptoms on day zero. Um, her uh, first symptoms really were malaise and not wanting to eat. Um, and then she had fever as well for the first two days. On the second day of illness, she developed a rash, fairly nonspecific. Uh, this is not her, but this is exactly what her rash uh, looked like early on in the course of her illness. So blanching, maculopapular. Um, mom had noticed it on her torso, but also had noticed it on her arms and legs. So on the third day, she visited um, the office of her PCP. And at the time, she just had fever and rash um, and just kind of the feel bad. So didn't really have a lot of other localizing symptoms. She was, oh. She was diagnosed with um, a viral illness at that time and um, sent home with supportive care. On day five, um, after another two days of continued fever and rash, not eating well, um, and also complaining of some headache and belly pain, mom took her to the local emergency department where she um, was diagnosed again with a, a different viral illness. And this time they gave it a name and told that, uh, the family that this was enterovirus. So this was May, um, she lived in Kentucky, um, enterovirus, we know we start to see a lot of enteroviruses in the early summer. Um, and so absolutely could have been enterovirus at this point in time without any other localizing symptoms. Um, she was instructed on supportive care and sent home. Uh, she progressed and got worse. And by day seven of illness, um, she actually developed um, mental status changes. She didn't recognize her mom or her dad. She'd had vomiting um, and had her rash had developed into more of a petechial rash that you can see here on her limbs a little bit. Um, she went back to her local emergency department, was evaluated for sepsis, and was started on broad um, spectrum antibiotics, including doxycycline, um, due to the concern for tick-borne rickettsial disease. And she was actually transferred up here um, to our ICU. Um, paired Sarah, so at the time um, she had negative, uh, negative antibody titers for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but we checked two weeks later and she had seroconverted and she was ultimately diagnosed with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, so this is just to, to kind of show you how these patients may present and how early on they, they can look like all the other things that we usually see in and out of our offices and um, in the emergency department with just kind of some nonspecific symptoms that can fall into a lot of categories. And so um, it's just a, a matter of being mindful and kind of um, making sure that these children have good follow up as we kind of as they kind of progress through their illness. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Maddie in a few minutes. Um, but I did just want to start off with the case. So vector-borne diseases are really a hot topic right now. Um, well, they were a hot topic until COVID came along. But um, this article came out in the summer, uh, last summer actually, saying that vector-borne diseases had tripled in the United States since 2004. Um, and really vector-borne diseases are both mosquito-borne and tick-borne infections. Um, but the bulk of this uh, paper showed that most of these vector-borne diseases were tick-borne diseases, so three-quarters of them were tick-borne diseases. Reports had doubled from 2004 to 2016, um, and Lyme disease made up 82% of the tick-borne disease reports. And then additionally, the combined incidence of anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis increased each year as well. And so this came out um, and I think really spawned a lot of discussion among infectious disease physicians and local 
um, and um, primary care physicians and that we need to be mindful of these diseases when we see some of our patients um, for acute illnesses. So I like the history of medicine too. Um, and so since we're gonna be talking about rickettsial diseases, I thought maybe I would introduce you to Howard T. Ricketts. Um, he was actually a pathologist in the Bitterroot Valley of Montana back in the early 1900s. And it is uh, for him that uh, the rickettsial diseases are named. Um, he actually wrote a paper back in 1909 describing some of the first case reports of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So like I said, to start off, we're gonna talk about the rickettsial diseases and I've listed them here. So the, um, the ones that fall into this category are Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis are the ones uh, most of us have probably heard about before. I also put on here rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis as well as Pacific Coast tick fever, which have uh, been identified really in the last 20 years or so, so a little bit newer. Um, and we will talk about one of those that we may see here in Kentucky. And so in thinking about which ones we might um, see in children in our, in our area, um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever and ehrlichiosis are the two main ones. Um, and then rickettsia parkeri, uh, there have been cases of that in, um, in Kentucky as well. So as we go through um, the discussion of the rickettsial diseases, I have seven main, um, main ideas that I want to impart on you guys today. Um, and so the first one is that ticks transmit, transmit the bacteria that cause um, these diseases. And so ticks are really the important vector here. Each of these disease processes um, has a bacteria that causes it. Um, and I've listed those here. Not important really to know the names of the bacteria necessarily. Um, it's really uh, more important to know which ticks can carry which bacteria and then where those ticks are found. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about the ticks here in just a second. The other important part is that these bacteria, um, once inside a human, so once a human is infected, these bacteria like to live in certain parts of our body. And so the rickettsia rickettsiae, which causes um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, lives in endothelial cells. And that um, explains a lot of the uh, clinical manifestations that you'll see with Rocky Mountain spotted fever because it causes a vasculitis. Um, ehrlichiosis, uh, the bacteria, there's three different ones that are listed here. The one that we see infection with is Ehrlichia chaffiensis, which is the first one on that list. And it tends to live in monocytes. And I'll show you a picture actually um, where we can see the Ehrlichia organisms within a monocyte in a patient. And then anaplasmosis, which we don't see in Kentucky, um, the anaplasma bacteria lives in granulocytes. So moving on from the bacteria to the ticks, um, I've listed the ticks here and um, I'll show you their geographic ranges in just a second. But you can see um, the size of a dime and the relative sizes of ticks. I'm sure all of us have seen ticks before. Um, the adults are fairly easily identified, but the nymphs are very small and may not um, you know, people may not find them on their bodies. And so, but they can transmit disease. So it's important to recognize that um, the life cycle of the tick, uh, many of the, uh, I'm sorry, the adults and the nymphs can transmit the bacteria to humans. Ticks can also attach anywhere. Again, um, if you've lived in Kentucky for any period of time or really anywhere in the United States, you've probably found a tick on you at some point in time. This is a tick that I actually pulled off of a patient um, here in the hospital, it was actually under their axilla. Uh, they were here for other reasons, but we did find the tick on them. And this is actually an adult Lone Star tick. So if you can see, there's a little white dot on the torso, um, and that is a very nice identifying characteristic of these ticks. These are also adult Lone Star ticks. Again, you can see the tiny white dot. Um, these are actually ones that my parents pulled off of them just this summer um, here in Jefferson County. And then this picture um, is actually a tick that is embedded in the tympanic membrane of a little boy's ear. This was actually a photo that was featured in the New England Journal of Medicine um, last year. This patient, oh, this patient um, had to have the tick removed in the operating room. In the operating room, luckily, he never had any symptoms of um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. 
One question I tend to get a lot is how long does the tick have to be attached in order to transmit bacteria? Um, in general, the ticks require 24 to 48 hours of attachment, um, and, those and then the incubation periods from the time um, of attachment to when the patient may develop symptoms ranges anywhere from a few days to, to up to two weeks in some cases. Um, I think what we'll, as we kind of go through the talk, what we'll realize is that a lot of times people cannot tell you how long the ticks have been there. Um, you know, especially with kids, they play outside all summer long. If they've had one tick, they've probably had several ticks. Um, and so some of these ticks can attach and eventually fall off. Um, and so some people don't realize that they've had a, a tick attached for any period of time. So the next um, point is that these are geographically important. So you have to live in an area where there are certain tick species in order to um, get bitten by the right tick that can then transmit the bacteria to cause disease. So for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, the bacteria can be transmitted from uh, three different ticks that are found here in the United States, the dog tick, the Rocky Mountain wood tick, and the brown dog tick. Um, and as you can see here, really, it doesn't matter where you live in the United States, you are potentially at risk for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The other spotted fever group rickettsiosis is the R. parkeri um, disease which actually is transmitted by the Gulf Coast tick. And that tick um, lives, well, along the Gulf Coast um, and also the, the southern eastern seaboard of the United States. So when you look at the CDC's annual reported incidence of the spotted fever group rickettsioses, including Rocky Mountain spotted fever, you can see that Kentucky is one of the dark states. Um, and this is, um, these, these darker uh, states here in the Midwest and South, um, Southeastern United States actually represent the tick belt. So classically has been called the tick belt because this is where the majority of the tick-borne rickettsial diseases are found in the United States. And then you'll see that ehrlichiosis follows the same kind of pattern, but transmitted by a different tick. And this is the lone star tick, um, which you can see here with the big yellow dot. This is an adult. Um, tick here. And again, um, looking at the reported incidence of Ehrlichia, same thing. Um, most commonly, um, these diseases are found in these states here in the um, Midwest, Midwest and Southeastern United States. Anaplasmosis um, is transmitted, the bacteria that causes anaplasmosis is transmitted by the Ixodes scapularis and Ixodes pacificus ticks shown here. While Kentucky is um, in yellow up here for Ixodes scapularis. This tick really, um, its geographic range is really the upper Midwest, so Minnesota, Wisconsin, and then the um, Northeast, so the New England states. It's the same tick that can transmit Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease. So we don't see this um, disease uh, much here in Kentucky. And you can kind of see that here, looking at the reported incidence of anaplasmosis. The darker states um, are the New England states and the upper Midwest. Now, um, I kind of went back through some of the CDC uh, reports. So looking at the reported cases of tick-borne rickettsial diseases in Kentucky um, over you know, this, the five years between 2013 and 2018, which is the newest data I can, could obtain from CDC, you can see that it does appear that the incidence of these infections is going up over time. I suspect some of this is that um, we are testing for it more because we're more aware of it. Um, but it may also be that uh, there are more ticks and more in ticks that have that carry the bacteria and are infecting people. Tick-borne rickettsial diseases are more common in the summertime, which is a direct reflection of the ticks lifestyle and the intersection between tick and human activity. So if you look at seasonality of all the cases reported in the United States, you can see that most of them are reported in June and July with um, it kind of going down out from both sides of the, of the curve here. May um, and August, uh, we'd also see a lot of cases. In fact, we've actually had a couple of cases recently here. And the first cases that I've seen um, usually start to come up in May. But cases can be reported in the winter months. And so that's an important, um, an important point because uh, while adult ticks tend to lay dormant during the winter months, if they're disturbed, so like if you go into a cabin or you're hiking in the woods and you disturb 
um, some of these ticks that are dormant, they can, you know, wake up and latch onto you and bite you and can transmit bacteria during that time. Case fatality rates are actually higher in the winter months because I think people are less likely to suspect tick-borne disease. So it's really important when getting the history uh, um, from a patient to kind of know where they've traveled and what some of their activities have been in the last you know, week or two. The other thing about rickettsial diseases is that um, severe disease seems to disproportionately affect children. So I show you this graph here looking at um, spotted fever group rickettsioses, including uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, the incidence by age. And you can see that um, uh, older adults tend to, or the incidence is higher in our older adults um, than it is in children. But if you transpose the case fatality rate by age group here um, on that same graph, you can see that the case fatality is much higher in the younger children than it is in the, the um, older adults, despite the fact that the incidence is lower. And this is uh, probably related to two factors. Um, one being that children present all the time with fever and rash or fever and nonspecific symptoms. And we think that it's um, most commonly, it's gonna be a viral infection. Um, and so uh, children may not be treated as early um, versus an adult doesn't come to the doctor a lot for uh, different viral infections or kind of fever and nonspecific symptoms. So people may be more apt to think about tick-borne diseases in adults. The other thing um, is that this is, a, again, a little bit older data because there isn't anything recent, um, is that uh, people have been hesitant over time to not to use doxycycline. And really that is the treat, to use doxycycline in children due to the risk of tooth staining. Um, but really that is the treatment of choice and really the only treatment available out there for the treatment of these diseases. And so um, they may be treated with something else or they may not be treated at all because they're thought to have a viral infection. And so um, delayed treatment can be associated with an increased fatality. So moving on to the clinical features of these infections, I think it's important to know that um, the clinical features do overlap with each other. So Rocky Mountain spotted fever and ehrlichiosis, sometimes I can't tell them apart. Like I can see a patient in the hospital and not know, you know, not say for sure which one the patient has. In the end, it doesn't matter because we treat them the same and we work them up the same. Um, but they can also look uh, like other diseases. And so the clinical features do overlap with other infections that we may see in children. So common symptoms in these infections is usually it's a sudden onset febrile illness. Um, and then they have nonspecific symptoms early in the course, just like Maddie. So headache, chills, myalgias, um, malaise. They may have some nausea, not wanting to eat. Um, and abdominal pain actually is fairly common as well. When you look at Rocky Mountain spotted fever um, head to head with ehrlichiosis, almost every single patient has fever. Um, so kind of hard to have spotted fever without fever. So fever is really a prominent symptom. Most patients with Rocky Mountain spotted fever will have a rash. So um, more than 97% will develop rash. Um, we don't tend to see rash as frequently in ehrlichiosis. Um, used to be called, you know, sp spotless, Rocky Mountain or spotless fever. Um, but I would say that generally we do see a rash um, in children with ehrlichiosis. And so um, this paper actually looked at cases that said about two thirds of patients with er children with ehrlichiosis do develop some sort of rash. Altered mental status, while not one of the first signs, can develop um, longer in the course if the patient goes without treatment. And up to a third of these patients will develop um, some sort of altered mental status as well. Other clinical manifestations in both of these um, infections are here. Uh, one thing I want to make a note about with Rocky Mountain spotted fever, anecdotally, these children can have calf pain, which is kind of an unusual symptom. Um, both of these infections can, um, you, you can see capillary leak in both of these infections, and so you will see edema um, of, the, of the eyes, the hands, um, other peripheral edema. And then children with ehrlichiosis can look like they have an upper respiratory infection too, so some of these children will have cough and sore throat when they come in. There are classic Rocky Mountain spotted fever triads described in the literature. So like rash, fever, and a history of tick bite, or rash, headache, and fever. 
Um, unfortunately, these triads really only identify children with true Rocky Mountain spotted fever only about two thirds of the time um, in the first triad and only about half of the time in the second triad. Um, we find that a lot of uh, parents aren't able to give us a history of a tick bite here um, when some of these patients come in. And so it may not be thought about by practitioners because they don't give that history of tick bite. But really, I think anywhere in our state, um, if the child plays outside, they are potentially at risk for a tick bite here. I, I have a lot of pictures of the rash in both Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Ehrlichiosis um, because it's one of the real prominent, um, one of the real prominent symptoms. So the rash usually occurs about two to four days after the onset of fever. Um, usually starts as a blanching maculopapular rash. It technically starts out on the peripheral in your, um, on your arms and legs and spreads inward. Although to be honest, we don't usually get that kind of history from the parents. Usually they just notice that there's a rash. Um, but these are actual pictures from patients here um, that we've seen here on our service. Involvement of the palms and soles is very common, especially in Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And you can see those pictures um, here. The one on the left is one of our patients. Um, but they don't have to have involvement of the palms and soles. So if you don't see involvement of the palms and soles, but everything else seems to fit, um, don't rule that out because you may not necessarily see it. And sometimes it's a late finding in some of these patients. The face, interestingly, is usually spared. Um, petechiae is a later finding. Um, and you can see these patients with petechiae. Um, because of the vasculitic nature of, Rocky, of the rickettsia that, that um, hang out in our endothelial cells, you can actually see per, um, peripheral necrosis as well, um, like this picture here on the lower right. Now the rash in ehrlichiosis is uh, much more nonspecific. Um, and so these are actually two patients um, who had ehrlichiosis. And as you can see, it's kind of a real nonspecific rash, uh, usually blanches at first, can evolve into petechiae, um, but early on really looks like a viral rash. While I said that the majority of patients with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever do have a rash, sometimes it can be atypical. So um, it can be sort of evanescent, so may not be as noticeable. Sometimes it can be localized to only one part of the body. And then in children with darker skin, it may be hard to detect. And the absence of a rash does not necessarily rule out Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, and in fact, it is a risk factor for delayed diagnosis and is associated with a poor outcome. I think um, when we have Rocky Mountain spotted fever, we want to see spots. And so um, just remember though, if you have a patient who clinically fits the picture and you have a high suspicion, even if they don't have a, a rash, um, you may wanna you know, think about and treat for um, one of these infections. Unfortunately, if left untreated, the late manifestations of Rocky Mountain spotted fever and ehrlichiosis can be um, devastating. So some of these children will have pneumonitis, ARDS, acute respiratory failure, shock, and DIC. Um, the case fatality rate of untreated um, patients is two to 4%. Um, and then there are long-term complications that have been seen in patients who've had Rocky Mountain spotted fever, although I think in general, this is not the norm. Um, but they can, they can have hearing loss, behavioral disturbances, learning disabilities, and peripheral neuropathy. So I, I talk about all of these um, kind of scary things that um, can happen in patients who are not treated uh, quickly. But um, we know that some of these patients, actually a lot of patients probably are seen as outpatients and are started on medication as an outpatient and never make it to the hospital. And so, and there are probably a lot of patients who may have um, um, not that may get sick or have mild illness and do not progress to severe illness. And so it's hard to know who those patients are up front, which is why we, we um, stress the importance of thinking about this and treating early for this if you suspect it. Um, but we do know that in some areas, uh, for example, like in North Carolina, I had a, a colleague who worked down there and he said, that a lot of the practices down there, if they thought they had a patient with one of these diseases and they came into the outpatient office, they would just start them on doxycycline and the kids would usually get um, better right away. Now we don't do that quite as often here in Kentucky, but I think it's definitely something to, to think about or if you're worried about to go ahead 
um, and maybe test for it. And while you're waiting to go ahead and start therapy in a patient who may clinically give a really strong suspicion for this. Lab findings um, are usually that these kids have a normal white count with a left shift in Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but we will see leukopenia in our lichiosis. Um, hyponatremia, elevated AST and ALT, and thrombocytopenia we will see across the board. Um, in some of the sicker patients, we will see hyperbilirubinemia, a prolonged PT. Um, many of these children will have anemia. Um, we've definitely seen a, a high CK and LDH as well. And then in ehrlichiosis, um, if you recall, I had said that the, the ehrlichia organisms hang out in monocytes. This is actually a bone marrow biopsy of a patient here um, where the, this little cluster of little purple cells down there, kind of in the right hand corner at the five o'clock position, that's actually a cluster of moruli, um, which is the, the name for a cluster of ehrlichia organisms within a cell. This cell actually is also demonstrating hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Uh, this patient was very sick with ehrlichiosis, um, and ultimately we had a strong suspicion for HLH as well, and she was and ended up being treated for both. Um, and so this, this picture actually demonstrates the ehrlichia organisms there, but it also demonstrates this large macrophage that has eaten other cells. Um, in her bone marrow, which is probably which was contributing to her uh, severity of her illness. The differential diagnosis for these patients um, is broad, and so I know I've I kind of har I've been harping on this the whole presentation, but I really think that early on these kids look like they have a viral illness. So enterovirus might be on the differential. Um, if they're younger children, they might look like they have roseola. Um, fifth disease, um, absolutely on the differential as well. In patients who have had five days of fever, some of them may look like they have Kawasaki disease. You know, they have a rash, um, they have five days of fever, and they have lab abnormalities that could be concerning for Kawasaki. Depending on what the rash looks like, um, staph toxin-mediated disease or strep scarlatina may be on the differential as well. If they have a lot of mucous membrane involvement, Stevens-Johnson might be a consideration. Once they develop a petechial rash, meningococcal disease is also um, a potential concern. We don't see it a lot, it is rare, but we, it's definitely something that we tend to um, treat for upfront in a patient with fever and petechiae. So we'll give um, rocephin after getting a blood culture, um, as well as starting doxycycline for tick-borne disease if, if it's the right um, clinical setting. I put COVID on here because I think, um, you know, MISC or that the multi-system um, inflammatory syndrome that's associated with COVID, um, these kids can come in sick they, um, and can look like they might have a tick-borne disease. And I think in fact, a couple of cases that we've had here at the hospital, we've covered for both or we've treated for both and suspected both early on. Factors associated with delayed diagnosis include, um, coming to a provider early in the course. So if they come on day one or two of illness, then they probably don't have a lot of the, the signs and symptoms that would maybe push someone over into thinking about um, a tick-borne disease. And um, you know, the parents may go home and think, well, I've already seen a doctor and wait another two or three days before they re-present. Absence of history of tick attachment is another concern. We kind of talked about that. Absence of the rash. Um, absence of headache, although uh, to be honest, we don't, not all kids are very good at kind of telling you about um, their heads hurting in these cases. And then obviously illness outside of the summer months. So, cause we think about this as being a summer infection, it's obviously um, when, that, when it more commonly occurs, but um, if they have the right epidemiological link in the winter, so like hiking or camping or um, staying in a cabin that they had to clean out or something, those are risk factors for um, tick bites in the winter. In an attempt to try to um, figure out a way um, to identify these patients um, in the outpatient setting, uh, Dr. Marshall um, and I actually had kind of come up with this algorithm to try to make people think about tick-borne disease in certain instances. And so I, I show that here. I'm not gonna walk through it. We've walked through a lot of um, the lab findings and the clinical findings. But if you are worried and you have a strong suspicion 
um, the take home point really is to go ahead and test for it, but while you're waiting for the result is to go ahead and start treatment as well. So I'm gonna take a quick sidebar and talk about um, one other um, spotted fever rickettsiosis, and that's the, the one caused by R. parkeri. So this rickettsial disease is transmitted by the Gulf Coast tick, which we don't see a lot of here in Kentucky, but there have been cases of this infection here in our state. These patients tend to present just like a child with Rocky Mountain spotted fever or ehrlichiosis, so fever, um, rash, generalized malaise, and other nonspecific symptoms, but they tend to develop an eschar at the site of the tick bite, and so you can see those in these pictures here. They also tend to not be quite as sick um, as um, the other kids. And then these are just um, some examples of the rash you might see in this patient, in this infection. So rash is common in this um, particular infection, just like um, in Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but we do not tend to see eschars at tick bite sites with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. That does seem to be very um, specific to this particular um, rickettsiosis caused by uh, R. parkeri. So when thinking about um, what to do or how to test for these infections, uh, the gold standard really is sero serology. Um, a couple of caveats though, is that sending for serology, so antibodies can cross-react with all the different spotted fever group rickettsioses. So um, you may not get a, a firm diagnosis of Rocky Mountain spotted fever or lichia because it may be one or the other, but we can send um, serology and we should send serology. The other problem is that, um, as, as you all know, it takes a couple of weeks for us to make antibodies to an infection. And so if you're testing early on, like on day three or four of illness, um, you may have a negative test. And so it's really important to send um, confirmatory tests later on if you really suspect that's what the patient has and you don't have an alternative etiology for their symptoms. So a negative test really does not exclude infection. If you had a high suspicion early on and your test is negative, we often do not stop the doxycycline um, if we still think that's what the patient has. Um, and then the other, the other important part is some of these tests, we're able to actually get testing done pretty quickly here, um, usually with results within 24 hours. Um, but depending on where you may be in the state or where you send your tests to, um, it could take a couple of days or a few days. And so we do recommend treating empirically, so not waiting for your test results. But if you really have a high suspicion, test and start treatment. You can also do PCR on whole blood for um, the ehrlichios for ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. You can take a skin biopsy of the eschar or of a rash in one of the in Rocky Mountain spotted fever and send for PCR as well. Although the availability of those tests can be limited, um, and while PCR is a great adjunct, um, a negative PCR does not necessarily rule out infection either. So here at Norton Healthcare, we have the ability to send something called a tick-borne disease panel. Um, and you can see this is um, an example of what the panel looks like after it's resulted. Um, and so what's nice about this is it sends the Ehrlichia PCR, um, and it also sends um, serology for Rocky Mount or for Rickettsia or Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, and so this is a negative panel. Um, the important part is that the serum is good for the serology, but if you actually can send whole blood, that's what we PCR because that's the part of the blood where the monocytes will be, which is where the Ehrlichia organisms um, like to live. So the other thing about this um, uh, tick-borne disease panel is that it does test for Lyme disease too. We haven't talked about Lyme disease yet, but it does not present the same way as ehrlichiosis or Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So it's interesting that it's on the panel. Um, when I send the panel, I'm thinking one of these rickettsial diseases, not Lyme disease. And if I'm concerned about Lyme disease, I just send um, a Lyme test separately. So just kind of a note that it's on here, um, but I tend to ignore that. And I, um, at some point, I think we're trying to maybe have those separated so because they do present, the presentations are so different between the rickettsial diseases and Lyme disease. 
And then the last point here is that therapy has to be started early. Um, doxycycline is the drug of choice for all ages. It does not matter your age. Um, and you should treat as soon as you suspect one of these infections. Put the dose here with the max dose. It can be given oral or IV. And it's recommended to continue therapy until the patient is afebrile for three days and has demonstrated clinical improvement, which ends up being a length of therapy of about seven to 10 days in most cases. Um, they may have, the patient may have fever or, and persistence of symptoms for a couple of days after starting treatment, but usually by 48 hours after the first dose of therapy, um, usually the patient um, has at least deaf or best. Um, if they were really sick when they presented, you may not see a lot of clinical improvement right away, but usually the fever goes away by 48 hours. If it doesn't um, and you don't have a positive test, um, then sometimes in some of those cases, we will look for other things. Um, but, but it should, if you have a tick-borne rickettsial disease, um, your fever should go away within about 48 hours. So just a note about doxycycline. Um, there have been a lot of studies done on looking at doxycycline and tooth staining. This is the most recent one from 2015, um, and basically no visible dental staining in children treated with doxy for suspected RMSF. So um, no reason not to give doxycycline to these patients. And in fact, it's the only thing that treats these infections. And so we really should not hesitate to start doxycycline. Uh, this is just a quote from the Red Book that basically says it has not been proven to cause cosmetic staining of adult teeth and can be used in, to treat children of any age safely for rickettsial disease. And then just remember that if you do have a positive test result, um, these are nationally notifiable diseases. And so <clears throat> we do need to report it to the state health department. If it's been performed here um, within Norton Healthcare, then those are reported by the lab. And so you're not res necessarily responsible for reporting those. So the take home points for the rickettsial diseases is really to make sure you um, recognize early on possible tick-borne rickettsial disease in Kentucky, test if you're worried, start therapy before you get your test results, um, and don't stop therapy if you have a high index of suspicion, um, even if your test is negative. Um, and then make sure that those results are reported to the health department. And just so you know, that is Maddie. Um, she, I actually got to see her in follow-up about three weeks after discharge from the hospital, um, and she was doing really very well. Um, and so it was great to see someone um, it was great to see someone recover so well from such a serious infection. So I wanna, I just have a couple of slides about the tick-borne viruses. Um, we have not seen um, much of these here, um, but they have been on the news. So I wanted to make sure that I mentioned them. There are two tick-borne viruses that I'm aware of that can be found here um, in Kentucky. The first one is Heartland virus. It's a virus that's transmitted by the Lone Star Tick. Um, and it was first detected in two farmers in Missouri um, back in 2009. There's been only about 40 cases to date in the literature, although I suspect it occurs more frequently than we know. Um, some of these cases can be asymptomatic and then there's some um, that have been very sick. And in fact, there's been at least two deaths reported uh, for, from Heartland virus. Bourbon virus is another virus um, that I would love to claim, but actually is um, thus named after Bourbon County, Kansas, not Kentucky, um, because that was the first case um, which was identified in Kansas. Again, another virus that's transmitted by the Lone Star Tick, which really seems to be the problem tick around here. Uh, really limited information in the literature currently. Um, a few cases have been reported. One death was reported in a patient who was immunocompromised. Um, Ultimately, these viruses present just like uh, the rickettsial disease, so it looks just like Rocky Mountain spotted fever and ehrlichiosis. Not easy to test for, and so um, I think we've sent, we um, as ID physicians have sent for these tests a couple of times. We have to do it through the uh, state health department, it ultimately goes to the CDC. And when we think about it is when um, we have a patient who has a t what is presumed to be a tick-borne illness, all testing is negative, they haven't improved on doxycycline, um, and I don't have an alternative explanation, and it just really seems to fit tick-borne um, illness. We have um, sent uh, blood samples off to, to the CDC to try to confirm it. 
There unfortunately is no specific therapy for the viruses, it's just supportive care. Okay, so I think I have maybe about five or six more minutes. Um, and so I want to quickly go over Lyme disease. And the reason I, I didn't really plan to spend a lot of time on Lyme disease is because one, we don't see it um, as frequently as the other disease, other infections here in Kentucky. And the other infections um, absolutely can be fatal acutely um, and can cause serious morbidity and mortality, whereas Lyme disease is more of a, a little bit of more of an indolent um, infection. Um, and I know we've had several cases identified in um, adults locally, but only a few cases of Lyme disease that we've seen in the last few years here. So Lyme disease is caused by uh, the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, it's a really pretty picture of it. It's a spirochete um, and it is transmitted by the black-legged tick. Um, and so the black-legged tick is shown here and the bulk of the infections occur in the um, upper northeast, so the states in New England, as well as the upper midwest, like Wisconsin and Minnesota. And so you can see, um, this is the CDC's most recent map of reported cases of Lyme disease in the United States. And really you can tell that Kentucky just um, has not seen a lot of confirmed cases here. I do think it's important to keep it in mind if you have a patient who has traveled to the northeast, um, or travel to the upper Midwest um, and comes back and has the right constellation of symptoms, absolutely we need to um, think about Lyme disease. But um, if you don't have a, a great epidemiological link, then it may, um, may not, you, you know, think of other things besides Lyme disease um, here in Kentucky. So up in the Northeast, um, the incidence is 30 to 80 cases per 100,000 uh, people. Um, and we actually have a much less um, incidence here. It's like less than 0.2 per 100,000 uh, population. So if you look at uh, reported Lyme disease cases in Kentucky um, in the four years between 2014 and 2018, um, confirmed, it's been somewhere between 10 to 15, and even in the last few years, or at least in 2017 and 2018, has been even lower than that, less than five uh, confirmed cases. This is on a slightly different scale, and it's really just to show you um, the, the, the difference in reported incidence um, of these cases of infections in Kentucky. So I've, I've put the green bar as the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and the purple bar is our lichiosis, and then you can see the red and blue bars as being confirmed and probable uh, cases of Lyme disease. So the other infections that we've already talked about are much more likely to be seen here. Ixodes scapularis is, um, this is uh, just showing you a, an illustration of what the ticks look like. I hope no one is eating lunch and I apologize if you are, but this is a nice picture that the CDC put out last, a couple years ago actually, to demonstrate the size of the nymphs. So this is a poppy seed muffin. Um, can anybody find the ticks? So there are five um, nymph Ixodes uh, nymphs on this muffin. And so uh, this just demonstrates that these things are tiny and the nymphs are um, uh, transmit 90% of the uh, diseases um, of Lyme disease. So the nymphs are responsible for 90% of the transmissions. So just very, very briefly, um, clinical manifestations of Lyme disease if you say the tick bite occurred on day zero, um, then within a week to two weeks, patients may develop er what we call early localized disease, which is a single erythema migraines, which I'll show pictures of, and then nonspecific symptoms like fever, malaise, and myalgias. The erythema migraines usually occurs at the site of a tick bite, and it is this target lesion um, with usually a darker red area surrounded by a lighter area and then a, another darker area. The center can become necrotic as well. Um, it can be a little atypical looking. So these are some pictures that CDC had up on their website kind of showing, you know, that you've got this purplish um, looking uh, thing on the top right. Um, the patch that's just a patch of redness um, there on the bottom left. Um, and these all, uh, the, er the single erythema migraines does occur at the site of the tick bite. So usually the, the patient will give a history of a tick bite at that location. 
If not treated at that point, then within days to weeks, um, these patients will develop signs of early disseminated disease, which can be multiple erythema migraines, um, which look like a bunch of target lesions all over the body. Um, can also have arthritis, Bell's palsy, um, and then some of these patients will also go on to develop carditis or heart block. Um, Bell's palsy is facial nerve palsy. This just kind of demonstrates that here. And then um, one comment on the arthritis, oops, sorry, one comment on the arthritis. It is usually a larger joint, so most commonly the knees, and it's usually out of it's swollen out of proportion to the pain. So like a septic joint, a pot child may come in with a big, hot, red, angry joint um, and have a lot of pain and it'll be red and swollen. With, a, with arthritis due to Lyme disease, it tends to be big, like really big, um, but the, the child may be walking around on it. Um, and so that makes one way to maybe distinguish between the two. We don't tend to get the referrals for the arthritis here in Kentucky, but I know our um, rheumatologists have actually gotten a few referrals for arthritis that ultimately ended up being um, Lyme disease. And then months to years later, you can have late disseminated disease, um, which can manifest in a, a number of different ways. So diagnosis, and I know we're running kind of quick on time, but diagnosis, um, is really clinical early on. And then as you kind of get further out, if you didn't, if the patient was not treated um, with the erythema migraines early on and develops disseminated disease, then serology may be helpful there. The, there's a two test, a two tier testing algorithm for Lyme disease. Um, and it's, so it's not a screening test and a confirmatory test. It's actually both tests have to be part of the, the algorithm. So it starts with a, just a, um, an antibody test like an EIA done um, quickly. If that is negative, then we do not go on and test um, for other antibodies to Lyme disease. But if it's positive or equivocal, uh, most, most labs will reflex to a second tier uh, Western blot where we're looking for both IgM and IgG if it's um, illness within 30 days. And if the patient has had illness lasting more than 30 days, then we'll just look for IgG Western blot. And there's a combination of different antibodies that we're looking for on the Western blot, which will ultimately confirm um, Lyme disease if that's the cause of the patient's symptoms. We do two tests because that first early on test um, can give false positive results because it's very, um, that antibody is very cross-reactive with other antibodies, um, including um, antibodies that we may have um, um, due to other disease processes or infections. Um, and also can be cross-reactive with our normal oral, oral flora. So if it's negative, great, it really rules it out. But if it's positive, we need to have a second test to just make sure that it's positive because of Lyme disease and not because of another reason. Um, the reason I said that um, erythema migraines is really a clinical diagnosis and you don't necessarily have to test for Lyme disease if you see that, it's fairly pathognomonic. And again, antibodies don't form for at least you know, two to three weeks after the onset of infection. And you may have the erythema migraines like in the first week after a tick bite. And so if you have it and you test, you may still be negative. But if the patient has the right epidemiological link, has been up to New York or Lyme, Connecticut, for example, um, then you would probably just treat in that case anyway. Um, I think it's important that on Lyme disease that usually these patients have very specific signs of infection. So the things we've already talked about, so erythema migraines or a history of erythema migraines, they'll have uh, Bell's palsy or specific arthritis. They usually do not just have the nonspecific symptoms. So I think that's important when you're thinking about Lyme disease in your patient population. You want to make sure they have the right epidemiological link and then you're looking really for some of these specific findings. Um, but fever and malaise or you know, fatigue all the time uh, usually is not just, is not Lyme disease and you should be thinking about other things. Treatment um, kind of depends on what type of uh, disease, which disease category you fall into. I'm not gonna go through it here, but doxycycline can be used at any age for the treatment of early localized Lyme disease as well. Um, and the Red Book has a, a nice, algorithm and a nice table here that shows you um, treatment doses and durations. Finally, um, 
Something that can look like Lyme disease, but probably isn't in this area is a southern tick associated rash illness called STARI. Usually um, the result of a bite from the lone star tick, like I said, it's the problem tick, not associated with disseminated complications um, and probably doesn't require treatment, but I'll tell you most of us would probably treat it with doxycycline anyway, um, because it may, you know, it may be Lyme disease. And so a lot of these are treated with doxy. I put this slide in here as kind of a joke to Dr. for Dr. McDonald, but um, alpha gal allergy is kind of a hot topic. And um, I, I just wanted to touch on it. We actually don't see patients um, here with infectious in, in the infectious disease division who may have alpha gal syndrome because it is an allergy. And so um, we recommend that these patients be seen by an allergist. But basically, um, the thought is that the bite of certain ticks, particularly the lone star tick, um, the lone star tick, when it bites you, spits um, alpha gal into the bloodstream of the, the patient. And the patient can make antibodies to alpha gal. Um, which isn't a problem in the short term, but alpha-gal is a sugar that's also found in red meat, so um, in beef and other red meats. And so if you have preformed antibodies to that, then the next time you eat red meat, some of these patients will have um, anaphylaxis or other very um, large allergic reactions. And so if you have patients who have that um, concern or you're worried about this, then we absolutely recommend um, that they maybe see an allergist to help kind of work through that. It is not an infection. Um, it's just that some of these ticks will actually transmit the sugar into the, into the bloodstream. And then another thing that's just been in the news is the Asian longhorn tick. Um, has been found in Kentucky, not thought to transmit any sort of infection at this point in time. So I know we are done with time, and so I'm going to end here. Um, I will take questions and um, anything else or any comments. Thank you. Sorry, ran a little long. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you, Dr. Statler. I'll skip all the questions about alpha-gal syndrome since you addressed it, but the, uh, there's a question regarding uh, prophylaxis. And so in treating kids who have a known tick bite, but the parents don't know the type of tick and rarely do they know the duration of attachment. And if the patient has no symptoms, do you go ahead and treat all these with doxycycline? Yeah, so we actually don't, and um, CDC has put out recommendations for that. So if you have a patient, a parent who calls with um, a known tick bite, um, we do not recommend prophylaxis, even if you don't know what kind of tick it is. So um, it is not recommended to prevent tick-borne rickettsial diseases. One, there's probably a low, there's a very low risk of infection. If you think about it, we've probably had millions of, there's probably millions of tick bites a year, and only a few of them um, go on to have serious infection. So I do like to educate the family and let them know what to look for and definitely to, to let you know or to come back in if the patient does develop symptoms. Um, but there's really a lack of proven efficacy, at least in preventing Rocky Mountain spotted fever and ehrlichiosis. For Lyme disease, um, it is not generally recommended, but in the Northeast, they will give a single dose of doxycycline to some of these patients um, if they meet all of the criteria here on this slide. So there's no reason doxy cannot be given. The tick was identified as an Ixodes scapularis tick, and the estimated time of attachment is greater than or equal to 36 hours. Um, and you can start the prophylaxis within 72 hours. We are not a state listed as um, endemic for Lyme, and you saw the, the picture of the United States um, earlier with all the Lyme disease cases in Kentucky, didn't have a lot of them. But if you know a patient who traveled and has gives this history, then doxy may be um, warranted in that case, but generally we have not given prophylaxis. Is there a place in Kentucky that has a higher incidence of Lyme disease? So that's a great question. Um, we have had, just anecdotally, it was totally anecdotally, We've had a, a, a few patients who reside in Carroll County um, that we've had a number of confirmed cases of Lyme disease over the last few years. And That's then, anecdotal, so I, I, I don't have specific information about other counties. All right, and then last question. Why, why is it the 24 to 48 hours of attachment um, of the tick? I mean, if you can, the tick bites you and 
as you stated about the alpha gal, you know, spits stuff into you. Why isn't the bacteria transmitted? Why is it a bacterial load? Or I, I just don't understand the length of attachment. Yeah, so I don't know that I, I know um, the specifics about that. It's just thought that it needs more time for that bacteria to really get into you to, to really, um, you need that amount of feeding for the the tick to transmit the right amount of bacteria to cause infection. And I think the really important part point too is that most of the time the tick is not going to transmit a bacteria that causes infection most of the time um, but it's it obviously it's what we worry about when we see tick bites so okay. all right thank you dr statler and just a reminder that uh evaluation for credit for cma credit uh you will get an email uh if you don't want to do it that way if when you exit this presentation they sh you should see a link to a survey monkey where you can continue on and do the evaluation and get credit. And then I hope you will be able to join us October 21st for a presentation from Dr. Tad Seifert on children with concussions. And so thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Statler. And we will see you all next month.